Alpha India, KC5 RAI. Uh, they have the astronomy, but oftentimes I've already gone over stuff that I probably didn't know about. But I was wondering the difference, or like if someone's starting out uh, to just do st stargazing, which would be better, a reflector or a refractor telescope? And if, and why? KC5REI, if anyone can hear that and answer tonight. Yeah, I can uh, give an idea. There's going to be 9MW.
FC. I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet.
Uh, number nine, recent astro- astronomical discoveries. I'll get that one out. Number 10, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. Number 11, astronomical Q&A. Number 12, three, three, uh, will we get to all of those in an hour and a half or thereabouts? Maybe, maybe not, but uh, we'll fill it out. All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take low power short time check-ins. If you're one of those, I need you to check in now. Please come with your call sign, name, your location. Let me know if you're low power short time. November 5, Whiskey, Oscar, India, William, and Alan. Short time. That first one I got, which is N5, I said WOI, William and Alan, short time, and then I think the next one was a, sh- a low power. I have to tell you, you were about almost 100 percent noise. You could break the repeater, and I could kind of hear your voice, but that was it. If you could increase your power, uh, please do so now, and I'll try one more time to get you in. Uh, that second station after William, try again. All right, we'll give you another chance later on. Uh, if you're in a handy talkie, maybe you want to charge or change your battery. That would probably be a good idea. Okay, I will take general check-ins now. If you'd like to please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. Uh, here we go. November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Bill Interving. My name is not general, but I'll check in anyway. This is KF5, JHA, Chaz, Lipsky. November Tango 5, Tango Life, Tony, Portable in Dallas. KG5P, Mike and Richardson. I'm not a general, I'm just a crummy captain, or ex-captain. KG5P. I'm not a general, I'm an extra class. Mike in Arlington. Well, Fox Top 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Kilo Golf 5, Whiskey, Zulu, Zulu, Bob, North Dallas. Golf. Five, Oscar, Mike, Romeo, Marcia in Dallas. Bravo five, Oscar, Zulu, Lima, Brenda, and DeSoto. India five, Gulf Romeo Hotel, Melissa in Dallas. Gibbs and Carrollton. Five, Alpha, November, Papa, Allen in Dallas. Alpha Alpha 5, Alpha Hotel, Robert Richardson. Kilo 5, Kilo, Tango, X, X-Ray, Kelly and Quinlan. Okay, well, uh, let's see, I have writer's cramp on that one, but I, I 
I'll need a few fills through this, but let me go ahead and get everybody checked in here that I I have. I got um, N5BB, Mr. Bill over in Irving. I got K5JHA, Chaz and Mesquite. Uh, NT5TM, Tony in Dallas. KG5P, Mike over in Richardson. Now, the next station I got was Mike, to Whiskey 9. In, uh, this is Mike in Arlington. Whiskey 9, can I get your call again? I, I had uh, handwriting lockup. Okay, that's uh, Whiskey 9 or Mike Whiskey, Mike in Arlington. Excellent. I got Whiskey 9, Mike Whiskey. That's Mike over in Arlington. I got KF5 uh, uh, ZBL. I wrote that down wrong for some re reason. Bill in Farmer's Branch. I've got KG5 Zulu Zulu, Bob in North Dallas. Did I get that right, uh, Bob? Yes, you did. Very good, and welcome aboard. I think this is your first check-in on this net. Next up, I got KG5OMR, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. I got you checked in. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda in DeSoto, KI5GRH, Melissa in Dallas, welcome. Next station I need to fill, I've got Alan. Uh, Alpha November Papa is what I have. Hey, Alan, could I give you your, get your full call sign over in Dallas? Kilo 5, Alpha, November, Papa. Ah, thank you, Alan. K5, ANP. I got you checked in. AA5, AH, Robert Richardson. And K5, KTX, Miss Kelly and Quinlan. Additional check-ins, please come now. Hello, Golf 5, Whiskey, Victor, Lima, James, and Carrollton. Well, the second round's uh, quiet, but that's okay. I've got KG5, Whiskey, Victor, Lima, James, and Carrollton. I have you checked in. Let's go over to Echo Link. I may have to uh, scroll back up on the Echo Link check-in, but if you'd like to try us by voice, please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from, Echo Link only. I will give you extra time. Please come now. Kilo Golf 5, Bravo Zulu Whiskey, Jay near Weatherford. Whiskey Zero, Mike Bravo Charlie, Shane in Blue Springs in the suburb of Kansas City. Kilo 5, Julia, Delta Whiskey, John in Norman, Oklahoma. All right, let me go ahead and get those check-ins. I, I think I got everybody uh, who, who was on the chat box, but let me go ahead and get everybody checked in. We have um, K5, uh, uh, KG5BZWJ near Weatherford. I've got W0MBC, 
That's Shane over in Blue Springs, Missouri. Welcome, Shane. Welcome back. You're becoming a regular. K5JDW, John in Norman, Oklahoma, is a winter abode. And N5IMS, that's JJ in Carrollton. Uh, let me go ahead and open it up to anyone who would like to join us. Please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, and where you're transmitting from. station uh, you could barely repeat it might be our earlier uh, check-in try one more time if you can increase power improve position or stand tall get on a chair and stand higher uh, one of those we'll try one more time Party started, as they say. Uh, do we have any general announcements for this evening's NAT? They can be of ham, astronomical space, or of general interest to license hams. Uh, please come with your call sign. B5P. Number Tango 5. Tango Mike. Let's round up the usual suspects. We'll start with KG5P. Mike, you got something for us for us this evening? Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Tom. Well, we have a member of the who's a member of the, uh, the Facebook page, not a ham, who's uh, Dr. Marie Baja, and I'm going to talk more about him later. But uh, I recently f I found out yesterday that he was. Uh, awarded tenure at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, which means that that's a, that's a big promotion. And uh, with tenure, I guess that would make him an, an associate professor. And unfortunately, he's not a ham, so he's probably not listening to us now. But he is a member of the Facebook page, and he contributes uh, some information. And we'll talk more about this later tonight, KG5P. All right, very good, Mike, and thank you. Yeah, he did, and he's been a part of Space Hipsters over on the, the uh, Facebook page, which is, for people like us, which is just about everybody listening, this fantastic group. And he found us somehow. I don't know what it was, but he has contributed things. I, I Quite honestly, I'm not sure I understand what he's contributing uh, because I'm not that smart. But, yeah, okay, uh, you can give us more additional information later on. Next up, NT5TM. Tony, go ahead with your announcements or bulletins from KE5ICX. I just wanted to remind everyone that this is not the last minute of the evening. We do have the Afterglow movie discussion. McFly, listen, listen to my announcement, McFly, uh, about Back to the Future coming up right here at 10.30 p.m. on this repeater. If Principal Strickland is too scary for you, you could come to our next lecture lab one week from today, one week from today. Just bring $10, and if you can, your soldering tools, and you can build this cool scrolling LED display that shows the time, weather, information, all sorts of things you can program into it over Wi-Fi. It's a cool kit in a lot of ways, and there's a great post about it at w5sc.org. So, McFly, listen up. A uh, very cool movie discussion tonight, and then a very cool kit project next weekend. NT5, Tia. KG5P, uh, comment. Uh, 
Go ahead, Mike. Um, uh, you can contact uh, Tony direct if you need to, or just additional comment. Well, I just had an additional comment. I uh, got my scrolling uh, marquee sign together today. It works great. Uh, and for ten bucks, you can't buy the parts off Amazon. Uh, I think I spent about fifteen dollars for parts, so it's definitely a good deal. It's a great project and, and a very fun project. So uh, if you're at all concerned, if you, this interests you in any way whatsoever, uh, it's definitely de definitely a must-do project. KG5P. Very good, and uh, Bill, Bill has put this one together, um, and I think this is going to be a good one. I'm really looking forward to this one and uh, finding out how it works. I hope we can hack it, one of the things I really like to do. I don't know if it's possible, but if it is, I'd love to uh, scrape some of the info that uh, comes off that thing. Uh, for aircraft that fly over my house, uh, I live under 18 left, 18 left, yes, I did that by design for DFW Airport, and I love it, and I would love to get the uh, ADSB info that I pull off of one of my uh, um, RTLSDR dongles that I got here at home that pulls all that information and put it on that display, that would be uber cool. I don't know if that's possible. If it is, that'd be great. I have a feeling it is. And uh, uh, use, this, use it with this thing. Now that's next weekend. That's next weekend. That's at the Dallas Medical Center. It's located at 7 Medical Center Way. That's between uh, or on the northeast corner sort of kind of between 35 and 635. Go ahead and Google it. We're on the third floor. It begins at around 10 p.m. 10 p.m. 10 a.m. Not 10 p.m. 10 a.m. And uh, goes to, I don't know, 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, for the build. It's a great camaraderie. First come, first serve. So bring your 10 bucks. Correct change is required. And you get the kit. I don't know how many there are, but in any case, um, let me see. Bill may be there. Uh, Cat 5 zbl Bill, uh, if you're there, uh, how many kits do you got? Uh, and uh, what, what are the rules? K5ZBL from KE5ICX. from KE5ICX, you're being paged. Was that me? KE5ZBL. Sir, you've been, you're multitasking again. I know you are. Uh, but uh, we wanted to know about the, uh, the scrolling, um, uh, the thingy, the whatever that is, the clock, the, the scrolling clock. Uh, tell us more how many you got and, and all that jazz. We know it's 10 bucks, but tell us more. Hey, right, well, I'll read what's on the uh, website. Uh, uh, the AFR uh, site, like on the fourth Saturday of each month, starts at 10 o'clock, lecture and labs held at Dallas Medical Centers, uh, usually on the third floor. Uh, let's see here. We'll be building an internet connected LED marquee scroller clock based on a Wemos P1 Mini and a LED matrix panel. It'll be configured via Wi Fi to display, scroll the news, local weather, and a lot more like Bitcoin. Uh, oh boy, there's all kinds of things you can do. And then, uh, but it is a. Uh, um, we must D1, and it's going to come with the uh, with the D1 and the panel and the case, um, pretty pretty case, and I uh, have uh, 20 kits. So uh, 
so we'll be uh, all ready for that for $10. That's what it, and it comes with the mini USB cable as well, KFI's of you. Anything else? KE5P uh, coming again. I guess I'm net control. Go, go ahead, Mike, if you want to contact uh, Bill direct. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to comment on $10, and he also said they include the case. You can't even buy the case for $10. And I may buy two or three of them myself unless somebody buys them first, because that's what you're going to see in a long time. KG5P. I only uh, I only charge uh, what the materials cost, so uh, so there we go. So, uh, but yes, uh, ten dollars, and uh, like I said, it comes with the Wemos, the LED matrix, the uh, micro USB cable, and the uh, 3D printed case. So, uh, all that for ten bucks. Come enjoy it. Bring your P bring your PC, bring your soldering tools, and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, we'll uh, we'll make this. Uh, all the all the instructions are already out there. It's already ready to go. And uh, it should be a simple little uh, clock to build and uh, and to and to do. There's not much moving. There's more. Uh, there's more um, PC work than anything else. But uh, uh, it's a great little clock. I have two of them. I got one at the house and I got one at work. And uh, and uh, I got the one at uh, at the house doing ESPN news and I have the one at work doing uh, doing uh, CNN news. So. Um, it's uh, it's really cool. It's a atomic clock, you know, so it's, it's always up to date. K five is available. Good. Thank you both, and uh, thank you, Bill. No, I, I I actually asked you to run back to the radio to find out how many kits there were. Now this is a first come first serve, so bring your money. And I just preferred and show up at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. at Dallas Medical Center in Dallas, 7 Medical Center Way in Farmers Branch. You can Google it. We'll be on the third floor uh, conference room. Uh, it'd be easy to follow, uh, find us. Uh, just get off the other theaters. Turn right, turn right again, then turn left, and you'll see all your favorite hams in there fighting over those kits. So, um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. First, first uh, lecture in lab, we always have them the fourth Saturday of the month. Okay, well, I probably went too long on that one. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your questions and comments on that. Uh, let's see. I've got one more. No, I don't have another check-in. Does anybody else want to check in? Oh, I've got Shane. Uh, he's over on Echo Link. He is KX7 uh, WFT. Oh, that's Sean. He's in Denton. Uh, is it Sean? Sean. I wrote Shane for some reason. Sean. Over in Denton. I should know that. Okay, any additional check ins before I move on? Please come down. Kilo Golf 5, Zulu Mike Golf, Joe in Arlington. I like the recheck. India 5, Golf Romeo Golf, Esther in Dallas. All right, let's see here. I got, oh, I uh, messed up on Joe's on uh, Sean's call, let's see, KX7 Whiskey, ta uh, Whiskey, oh, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, I got it reversed, okay, I figured it out, Whiskey Tango Fox Foxtrot, I've got it corrected, Sean, 
I've got Joe, KG5 uh, Zulu Mike Golf over in Arlington, and i got Kilo India 5 Golf Romeo Golf in Dallas. Can I get your name? Sorry, I didn't get that written down. What's in Dallas? Kilo India, KI5 GRG. See, I still didn't get it. I'm going to turn my radio up to 11. One more time on your name, please. Esther in Dallas, KI5, GRG. All right, Esther, thank you. Third time's the charm. I got you checked in. KI5, GRG in Dallas, Esther. Thanks very much. Okay, let's see. Where are we at? Uh, oh, uh, my comments. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the announcements because we have other announcements. But uh, let me go ahead and give you the afterglow stuff uh, this evening at 10.30 p.m. comes the afterglow movie at net, and this is the story. This is the city, Hill Valley. Over 60,000 Californians live and work in this perpetually sunny place. But under, under its calming, folksy exterior is another story. Time-traveling DeLoreans, stolen nuclear material, flying steam engines, and unexplainable lightning also occur, sometimes under a darkness. I was working the day watch and received a call of the all of too much noise at the old Emmett Brown house. My partner and I went to check it out. Upon arrival were the shattered remains of the largest audio amplifier in the world. While weird phenomenon occur all the time in Hill Valley, loud noises was the biggest complaint. That's where I come in. You see, I'm the homeowner's code enforcer. Join us on the eve of Back to the Future, the musical, while we discuss the movie that started it all, Back to the Future, the movie, from 1985, tonight at 10.30 p.m. You know you want to be there, or you'll be there. And don't make like a leaf and get out of here, because you want to be there. You can keep up with all the DARC events, nets, and activities by going to the club website, which is whiskey 5 fried chicken. All right, we're going to number two, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Events, where and when you can look through a telescope. Anybody out there want to tell us about that? Please come in your call sign. Now, I suppose I could. KF5, JHH. J H H as please come now with your information. After your description of the afterglow, I want to go to the Twin Pines Mall. Oh wait, it's now the Lone Pine Mall, I believe now. Uh, oh yeah, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. They meet on the fourth Friday of each month at the University of Texas. Uh, so Texas Astronomical Society, excuse me, meets at the, <laughs> I'm all mixed up after the Lone Pine Mall. So Texas Astronomical Society at the University of Texas at Dallas on the fourth Friday of each month at 7.30. But usually at 7 o'clock, there's either a new members meeting uh, for brief information or a description of the dark site location. So come at, come at 7 o'clock uh, for that. But... This month, on February 28th, that's just in a couple of weeks from now, Robert Reeves will be our speaker at the meeting. He is Mr. Moon. That's what I call him, Robert Reeves. He's been an astrophotographer for more than 50 years. He's published uh, several different books. He knows the moon, well, maybe, maybe inside and out, because he's got geology as well as all sorts of other things. Especially, he'll show you pictures that he's taken He's taken tons of them, and he just got some new equipment. wonder if we're going to get to see some of those new pictures. So come now to 
to the next meeting of the Texas Astronomical Society. At Saturday nights, and particular locations located throughout the Metroplex, there are observing sessions for the Texas Astronomical Society where you can take a look through a telescope for free, as long as the clouds are not there. On the first Friday of each month, uh, excuse me, on the first, first Friday of each Friday, why am I saying Friday? On the first Saturday of each month, is the Stargazer Star Party Spring Park in Garland. That will be the next on March the 7th. The second Saturday of each month is the Frisco Star Fest in Frisco Commons Park in Frisco, of course. The next one for that is going to be on March the 14th. Cedar Hill Star Bolt would have been tonight if it had been clear. I think it was probably canceled due to the clouds. Next week is Stars on the Rock at the Shores Park in Rockwall. That will be on Saturday. February the 22nd. On the 5th Saturday, and we will have a 5th Saturday this month, usually the Astronomy Club will have a, an activity either here in town or at a Toka, their dark site. Uh, I can't remember what it's going to be, but when I find out, I'll let you know. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the Texas Astronomical Society, either meetings or observing sessions? I think we can go to Lone Pine Mall and see if I can record what they have. Uh, back to you, Tom, KFI, JHA. Well, thank you, Jess. And, oh, by the way, just for a little little, little fun, too, is, is that uh, the Facebook group, uh, some of us actually go and watch the movie at the same time. We uh, go ahead and check in over on Afterglow Movie. That's two words, Afterglow and Movie. Uh, and uh, watch the movie at 8 o'clock on Friday night. So if you'd like to join in on that, just say you like to join. I think it may be an automatic thing. I can't remember anymore. Just say you want to sign up and, you know, and if, if, if it's open to the public or anything, we'll go ahead and give you a link. Otherwise, you're on your own. You're going to have to figure out how to watch the movie. But in any case. All right, thanks very much, Jess. Appreciate the information. This is KE5ICX. I'm Net Control for tonight. Skynet! Next up is National Space Society of, uh, with events and activities. That would be Bill, N5BBOP. N5BB, Bill, you got a new nickname tonight. <laughs> what do you have for us for the National Space Society? Go ahead. Dora the Abuse. This is in fact BB uh, with National Space Society of North Texas News. The National Space Society North Texas chapter meets on the second Sunday of all months except for December. Our meeting location is the Spring Creek Barbecue at the southwest corner of Highway 183 in Beltline in Irving. This isn't far from the south entrance of DFW Airport. Our meetings start at 3.30 p.m. Um, the February meeting was this last Sunday, so it's over. Next meeting will be on Sunday, March the 8th. Um, there was an activity today which I did not attend uh, because we had too many people and not enough space, so I bugged out. And it was at the uh, uh, University of Texas at Dallas, UT Dallas. It was the engineering day um, meeting there for STEM, STEM students. So we were there today. Next Saturday, a week from the day, the Dallas Regional Science and Engineering Fair, yes, this is the Regional Science Fair, will be held, this is on February the 22nd, week from the day, at Fair Park in Dallas. I will be one of the judges for space-related things. The National Space Society North Texas chapter 
has been able to scrape together $1,000 for science fair projects, and we will be distributing those uh, next week. Um, there's no other really hot things coming up in the next couple of weeks for National Space Society. But I will remind everybody about the Irving Ham Fest three weeks from today, March the 7th in Irving. This is N5BB. Thank you, Tom. All right, thank you, Bill. And yes, uh, you do need to find out additional information about the Irving Ham Fest. So you can go to irvingarc.org for additional information. Uh, they even have a countdown there. If you're watching the video link, you'll see that as well. Okay, very good. Uh, let me go ahead and get N5OF Clay in Mesquite checked in. Um, Let's see here. Uh, oh, they're just, you got to remember over on Echolink, all sorts of things are happening. Really weird stuff, but that's okay. We, we appreciate them too, even if nobody else does. Okay, uh, this is KE5ICX and Net Control for tonight's Skynet. So let's see here. I'm going to, as Net Control this evening, I'm going to go ahead and tell you about a uh, topic. And this one I stole, yes, I stole from space.com. This is an article from Chelsea Gold having to do with will Betelgeuse finally explode? I probably said that wrong, but that's how we know it from the movie. So here we go. One of the brightest stars in the sky has been dimming, but while it might be knowing that it's ready to explode, it probably is just fading because of a strange stellar physics. Betelgeuse, a reddish star that's one of the brightest in the night sky, has been noticeably fainting or getting dimmer. The approximately 8.5 million year old star, which is uh, part of the Orion constellation, has been one of the most recognizable stars in the sky because of its brightness and coloration. But this recent dramatic fading has prompted scientists to suggest that the star might be entering a pre-supernova -super, super phase, dimming before it collapses and dies in a fiery supernova explosion. But if the star does become a supernova, Betelgeuse will likely be as bright as or even brighter than the moon for weeks or even more. and a half uh, light years from Earth, it would be the closest supernova observed and recorded by humans, closer than the Crab Nebula, which is 6,523 light years from Earth, and is the result of a supernova report to take place in 1054 AD. This also means that if we see Betelgeuse explode tonight, supernova really took place over 600 years ago. We're only seeing it now. It will be brilliant. The star would be so bright that it would make it difficult to see other stars near it. Edwin uh, Guinan, not, not that Guinan, the other Guinan, a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at uh, Villanova, U <laughs> what a name, Villanova University, who reported the dimming in an astron astronomer's telegram uh, told space.com. It should, would be the brightest supernova ever observed in our sky in our galaxy, but we really see Betelgeuse explode? Think about that for a second. It's not surprising that the extremely massive star, which is likely about 20 times the mass of the sun, has been dimming because it is a variable star, meaning its brightness naturally shifts, something that scientists have observed for decades. The star has been classified as a red supergiant star because of its size. However, with this recent dimming, the star's brightness kept going down beyond the limits that we scientists ever saw it. It went outside of its usual parameter or comfort zone, Guinan said. It's dimming a lot more than we've seen, uh, 
Theresina Nass, an astronomy graduate student who studies Vader and stellar explosions at UC Berkeley, told Space.com. But does that bidding for an explosion? We know massive stars like Vader Juice will explode as a supernova. The question is, when? observations of them, supernovae, that's the plural for supernova, before they go off, Guinan said. He explained that while some think that there wouldn't be any visible major changes in the star until just hours before it blows up. Others think that would start that it would start to dim about a year before exploding. There's no true consensus. While it's possible the star could explode any time between now and 100,000 years from now, it might not actually be a size about the ball, both Nance and Guinan said. He acknowledges that it would explode soon, and this dimming could be a sign that the explosion may happen relatively soon. Well, I believe it isn't going to happen or blow up now, Guinan said. I hope it does. But my bet is it's not going to. It's just going to come back up. You're going to get brighter again. He's waiting for the thing to fall. Nance admits we absolutely could be wrong, she said, referring to her theory that the dimming is not a sign that the star is about to explode. That said, I think that this is more indicative of really interesting physics that's going on far rather than an imminent explosion.
that scar on the upper left side of her eye might not be there tomorrow. So check it out soon or 100,000 years from now. I don't know. Apparently they don't either. But they're really excited about the possibility that it might blow up. So there you have it. Nope, I didn't say it. Didn't say it. This is KE5 ICX. Does anybody have any comments about this? Please come now. All right, I have additional check-in, I think. Someone's saying hi. KK6 is EUB. Can I get your name and where you're transmitting from? I'll put you on the list if you're there. You may run away. We're here. You're on the net. This is Skynet. KK6, EUB. Go ahead. Putting you on the list anyway. Additional check ins, please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. Kilo Kilo 6, Sulu Uniform Bravo, Elaine in Ohio. I have a recheck, uh, W0MB. Let me go ahead and get the uh, recheck. I think it's a CCP. Go ahead. Uh, welcome aboard. I had the recheck. This is W0MBC. Um, my recheck is I'm also adding a check in by. Say your name. Say your name. Bethany. Age. 10. I want to make sure you added her to the, the check in too. This is Shane W0NBC in, in uh, Blue Springs. I have my 10-year-old. Uh, Bethany. Want me to check in, too? Just want to make sure we're clear. Hi, uh, Elaine in Ohio. Very good. I, I've got her checked in as well. Thanks, Elaine, for checking in. And I got Mike, W9 Mike Whiskey, over in Arlington. And let's see, I think, I think I got everybody. Um, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take additional check-ins, or not additional, blah, 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 blah. let's go to space exploration and space history. That would be Brenda this evening. She's the one on the barrel, WB5OZL. Uh, Ms. Brenda, what do you have for us this evening? Good evening, Tom and the Net. I'm sorry, I am 
uh, a little slow. I didn't realize that was next. Let me pull this up. Give me a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this uh, this week, ten years ago, the Solar Dynamics Observatory was launched. It is part of the NASA program designed to understand the causes of solar variability and its impacts on Earth. SDO is helping us understand the sun's influence on Earth and near Earth space by studying the solar atmosphere on small scales of space and time and in many wavelengths simultaneously. <laughs> Scientists are learning how the sun's magnetic field is generated and structured and how the sun's stored magnetic energy is converted and released into the heliosphere and geospace in the form of solar wind, energetic particles, and variations in the solar irradiance. Seen here is a group of post-coronal loops, charged particles that are spinning along the magnetic field lines following a coronal mass ejection event in 2017. If you can see the picture, you can go that way. Uh, it's pretty impressive. In February 10th, 1992, was the first Atlas II launch. In May 1988, the Air Force chose General Dynamics, now Lockheed Martin, to develop the Atlas II vehicle, primarily to launch defense satellite communication system payloads and for com commercial uses as a result of Atlas I launch failures in the late 1980s. Led by lead engineer Samuel Wagner, the Atlas II was to the continued development of the United States Space Program. Atlas II was launched from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida, by the 45th Space Wing. The final West Coast Atlas II launch was accomplished December 20, 2003 by the 30th Space Wing, Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. Now this is real important. February 15th, that's today, is Galileo Galilei's birthday. He was born in 1564. Makes him pretty old. He was an Italian astronomer, system engineer, sometimes described as a polymath from Pisa. Galileo has been called the father of observational astronomy, the father of modern physics, the father of the scientific method, and the father of modern science. Wow. Galileo studied speed and velocity, gravity and free fall, the principle of relativity, inertia, projectile motion, and also worked in applied science and technology, describing the properties of pendulums and hydrostatic balances, inventing the thermoscope and various military compasses and using the telescope for events for scientific observations of celestial objects. His contributions to observational astronomy include the telescopic confirmation of the phases of Venus, the observation of the four largest satellites of Jupiter, and the observation of rings, and the analysis of sunspots. Also, on today, we have an anniversary. In 1973, Pioneer 10 becomes the first spacecraft to pass through the asteroid belt. It was launched on March the 2nd, 1972, by an Atlas Centaur expendable vehicle from Florida. Between July 15th, 1972, and February 15th, 1973, it became the first spacecraft to divert 
to traverse the asteroid belt. Photography of Jupiter began November 6, 1973 at a range of 25 million kilometers at 16 million miles, and about 500 images were transmitted. The closest approach to the planet was on December 4, 1973, at a range of 132,252 kilometers. During the mission, the onboard instruments were used to study the asteroid belt, the environment around Jupiter, the solar wind, cosmic rays, and eventually the far reaches of the solar system and heliosphere. Radio communications were lost with, Pi with Pioneer 10 on January 23, 2003, because of the loss of electric power for its radio transmitter with a probe at a distance of 12 billion kilometers from Earth. All right, that's all I got. Back to net. This is WB5OZL. For those uh, support, this is KE5ICX. I'm net control for tonight. Skynet! Okay, I want to um, mention, uh, let's go to WC0NBC Shane. I believe we have third party traffic. Bethany, Bethany, uh, welcome to the net. Um, go ahead and say hi. Uh, this is KE5ICX. Bethany from Brisbane, Missouri. Hi, Texas. Hi, Texas. Hello, Bethany, and thank you for joining the net this evening. We hope to hear from you again next week. We're glad you're here, and thank you for joining us this evening. Hope you'll come back again. Okay, let's see. Next up is Chaz, K-F-I-J-H-A. You have something for us this evening. Please go ahead. The net is yours, but you have to give it back after you're done. K-F-I-J-H-A uh, uh, from K-E-5-I-C-X. All this call sign stuff gets confusing. Go ahead, Chaz. lost him for a second. Let me see. What's next on the list? And we'll come back to him. Mike! Uh, KG5P. Mike, you have something on junk. Oh, we're being space. What do you got for us this evening? Okay, thank you, Tom. KG5P. Yeah, I was hoping to uh, hear from Chaz. I hope he's and the left one good, because I had a question for him, as I always do. All right, well, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about space junk, which I've always been interested in. I'll, let me go way back until I was a, a, a young whippersnapper, which is many, many millions of years ago. And I used to read Mad Magazine, and what Mad Magazine was saying about the, the garbage problem, we could shoot all the garbage into space. Soon, uh, Earth would look like Saturn with a ring of garbage floating around it. Well, I think that they may not have been too far off because that's essentially what we're getting into is we got a ring of garbage orbiting our planet. Okay, and I mentioned uh, Dr. Marie Baja, who is also a member of this group. Uh, except he's not a ham, so you'll never hear him check in. Although I was thinking about maybe patching him in. He's a, he's a professor of astrophysics at, at the University of Texas 
in Austin. And he's a really nice guy. Uh, I've met him, and he's, uh, just yesterday he was uh, promoted to, uh, well, I assume as associate professor because he has tenure. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been in the academic world. And what it was was only as a student, but uh, he, you know, he's, he's quite well known in his field. He travels all over the world to, uh, you know, make speeches and he attends conferences and stuff. But his specialty, and this is how I met him, is he was. Uh, He's a project. He's working on a project to monitor space junk, and and this is all very. Tom mentioned earlier that he can't follow his, you know, professor jobs, and I can't either. I mean, he's this is stuff for PhDs and uh, PhD candidates and stuff. So it's way beyond my way beyond my pay grade. But uh, that's what he does, and he's got apps and things that will actually track space junk and predict where they're going to be and when they're going to collide. So what we have here is an article from space.com, and I may only get through part of it tonight, so maybe I'll do the rest of it next week. But this is really interesting, I think. Okay, so uh, you probably remember earlier this week, or last week, uh, there were two satellites that were going to collide, and one of them, I believe, was the Kepler Space Telescope, which uh, did a lot of work on identifying exoplanets and stuff like that. But Kepler has reached the end of its life, and now it's just space junk. And, and it was going to collide with another satellite on this January 29th, and uh, they, they didn't really collide. They missed each other by 154 feet. So that's like, you know, it doesn't count unless it collides, I guess, like horseshoes and hand grenades. But anyway, this renewed attention for the growing problem far above Earth, a cloud of space junk. And again, this is Dr. Uh, Jaws specially. Okay. Okay, so millions of objects make up this orbiting junkyard uh, where all these hurtling fragments can reach the speeds of nearly 18,000 miles an hour. That's about seven times faster than the land bullet. There are, right now there's about 500,000 pieces of debris that are at least a marble size. And approximately 20,000 objects are the size of a softball, according to NASA. That was back in 2013, so who knows what we got now. Adding to the clutter is the proliferation of proliferation of these miniature satellites called CubeSats. I thought Tom was going to talk about CubeSats or somebody was. And these are like four inch long satellites and they weigh about three pounds. And each launch costs about forty thousand dollars, which is you know, pocket change. The private companies commission them by the thousands to gather and provide internet and radio service. Now, there's also CubeSats that carry amateur radio, and uh, believe me, I'm all for amateur radio, but, you know, uh, I, I should be throwing space junk just so we can add another mode of communication. So there's such a thing known as the, uh, um, The law of unintended consequences, and eventually the chickens are going to be roost. So, as much as I like satellites and stuff, throwing more junk up there, I don't think is the solution. So, with this buildup of space congestion, the aerospace engineers are racing to develop technologies and systems that can prevent crashes in order to uh, protect working satellites future space missions and people and property on the ground. And like uh, the anecdote is a piece of uh, paint, a fleck of paint could actually do serious damage on the space station because it has so much kinetic energy if it slams into it at 18,000 miles an hour. Approximately 
5,000 satellites carrying payloads in orbit around a planet, but only about 2,000 of these are active and communicating with the Earth, and the rest, of course, is junk. So currently, some, when something is launched, one of these launches can release 100 or more satellites, especially these CubeSats. The operators and the space surveillance people have to track every space, every piece of space hardware that is released by the rocket and determine individually which piece is which. And this is what Dr. Jaw does. That's what his, what his field is. So uh, what they're trying to do now is develop type of electronic license plate, what they call a license plate for satellite. But this will allow orbiters to broadcast their owners and positions as long as they're in space, even when the satellite ceases to function. The so-called license plate is about the size of a scrabble tile, you know, less than a square eight, small enough to be carried by even the tiniest cube sets, dubbed the Extremely Low Resource Output Identifier, or ELROI, resource optical identifier. It produces a unique identifying code, a satellite license number. And this has a latency of about 1,000 times per second. Patterns uh, created by the blinks translate into serial codes that can be read by telescopes on the ground, and thus identify the satellite's owner and its coordinates. Okay, because the ELROI, E-L-R-O-I, is powered by its own solar cell, it, it can keep talking to Earth after the end of the satellite's lifespan. And because LRA is small and lightweight, it requires no external power. It can easily be attached to pieces of space hardware that don't have radio transmitters, such as the rocket satellites out of space and free floating junk. Okay, I think I'm going to finish up here pretty quick, but by providing this trackable data for individual objects in the ever-increasing cloud of space degree, debris, Elroy could play a crucial role in heading off collisions. It could even monitor radio transmissions and working satellites and alert operators when communication is disrupted. Beyond its identification function, it can also be used as a low bandwidth diagnostic, such that it will help reduce the amount of broken satellites in space, and also license plate technology is the only is only part of the solution, but it's an important part. So there's another solution to rocket science, which I'll get to tomorrow. But this is the stuff Dr. Jaw is working on. And I just want to remind you that he is a professional and don't try this at home. So uh, I'll continue with this next week. Back to that. This is KG five P and I hope Chad shows up because I have a question for him.
version of Skynet. You must be monitoring all three areas at the same time. Tonight, the sunset was at 612 p.m. Central Standard Time. By about 645, Venus and Mercury could have been seen if it would have been clear in the evening sky tonight. And they'll be able to be observed over the next week. Mercury will be very low in the sky just after twilight. Uh, Mercury will become increasingly difficult to see over this week as it is getting close to the sun. Venus is the brightest thing in the sky other than the sun or the moon. Or maybe an exploding supernova, but we've already talked about that. So it's easy to spot, and it's about halfway up southwestern evening sky just as twilight is happening. February 27th, Venus will be just a few degrees to the right of the moon in the afternoon and evening. It'll be a great time to spot Venus. The date in sky be worth I don't I'm not hearing fun echo link as much. Maybe I'm in and out. Am I in and out of the repeater, Tom? Oh, you're fine. Uh, please continue. G five I six. Okay, thank you so much. Uh so, let's try to look for Venus in the daytime sky. So, on February 27th, around 4 6 p.m., you can start looking for the thin crescent moon about 45 degrees above the western sky. If you have the you can see the planet. Just be careful not to look at the sun through the binoculars. After finding the moon, you can spot that was just your two degrees and maybe. To the binoculars scan from the moon to slightly Venus. To um, binoculars, you can remove the binoculars so you can find Venus with just your two eyes. Again, be very careful not to look at the moon through the binoculars. This might take some practice to find Venus in the daytime sky. Speaking of the moon, it is at its third quarter phase today. The moon is new on February 23rd. The moon is at Apogee on February 26th at 26, just 406,278 kilometers. And the moon will be at its first on March the 2nd. Now, that reminds me, did you hear about the cow that all jumped over the moon? The cow uh, other destruction. This is KFJK, and this is Skynet. The moon will call the planet Mars early on the morning of February the 18th. That's Tuesday morning. You can watch this event with just your two eyes. But again, a pair of binoculars or a telescope will make it easier. Around 5.45 and 29 seconds a.m. Central Standard Time, will disappear behind the moon. And at 7.11, I like that. And 38 seconds, Central Standard Time, Mars will reappear from behind the moon. The reappearance will be at sunrise, so a telescope may be here to see that part of the event. The times for disappearance and reappearance are calculated for Brookhaven College. Times will vary by maybe as many as several minutes in other parts of the Metroplex. If you get up around 6.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, you'll also get to see the tree of three visible plants, one of which I've already mentioned is Mars. It's in the constellation of Sagittarius. To the left of Mars, you can find Jupiter. Below and to the left of Jupiter, you can find Saturn. Both Saturn and Jupiter are also located in the constellation of Sagittarius. On February 19th, the moon will be close to Jupiter in the morning sky. And on February 19th, the, the very next the moon will be close to Saturn in the early morning sky. If you haven't seen it, I want to remind you to look for Canopus. Canopus is the second brightest star in the sky. Canopus K. 
cannot be easily seen from here in North Texas because it never goes on about four and a half degrees. So it rise around nine o'clock this evening and over the next week. up there that could go supernova any moment. But that's the lower horizon. We won't be able to see that as supernova. Asteroid 2002, PZ-39, also known as Asteroid 3 stays in this asteroid. So why did 2002, PZ-39, make it in the news and the others didn't? The other ones were small and because 2002 PZ-39 is about half a kilometer in diameter, which is much bigger than those other ones. And maybe the media thought we needed something more to worry about, when a virus or virus or Australia or the time I 
Miss Billy, she's checked in uh, as well. And uh, let's see. Oh, some of that Nan Ellen built as well. Well, yeah, yeah, it all works out in the end. Okay, I'll go ahead and ma'am for additional check in. Whether you like to join this evening or say that you were there. Uh, or to say you're here now and you're actually somewhere else because you need an alibi. Time, please come with your call sign. Where you're transmitting from, please come now.
model for the mixing of materials associated with these impacts, revealing that the red planet may have formed over a longer time scale than previously thought. An important open issue in planetary science is how to determine or is to, to determine how Mars formed and to what extent its early evolution was affected by collisions. This question is difficult to answer given that billions of years of history has steadily erased evidently in many events. Luckily, some of this evolution is recorded in Martian meteorites. Of approximately 61,000 meteorites found on Earth, just 200 or so are thought to be of Martian origin, ejected from the red planet by more recent collisions. These meteorites exhibit large variations in iron-loving elements, such as tungsten and platinum, which have a moderate to high affinity for iron. These elements tend to migrate from its mantle and into its core, um, central iron core during formation. Evidence of these elements of the Martian mantle and the meteorites are important because they indicate that Mars was bombarded by planetesimal sometime after its primary core formation ended. Studying isotopes of particular elements produced locally in the mantle via radio radioactive decay processes help scientists understand when planet formation was complete. We knew Mars received elements such as platinum and gold. Hydrodynamics impact relations, said F.W. Dr. John Marcy, lead author of the advances paper outlining these results. Based on our model, early collisions produced a model cake like Martian mantle. These suggest that the prevailing view of Mars formation may be biased. <coughs> of meteorites available for study. Based on the of tungsten isotopes and Martian meteorites, it has been argued that Mars grew rapidly in about two to four million years to form. However, large early collisions would have altered the tungsten isotopes, which could support a Mars formation time scale of up to ten years as shown by the new model. Collisions by projectiles large enough to have their own cores and mantles can result in heterogeneous mixture of those materials in their Martian mantles. The co-author, Dr. Robin, associate, uh, assistant vice president of SWRI Space Engineering Division. This can lead to different interpretations of the time of Mars formation than those that projectiles were small and homogeneous. The meteorites that landed on Earth probably originated from just a few kilometers of the planet. The new research shows that the Martian could have received varying additions of projectile material, leading to variable concentrations of iron living. The next generation of Mars missions, including plans to return samples, will provide new information to better understand the variability of iron loving elements in Martian rocks and the early evolution of the red planet. All right, that's all I got. WB5OZL.
This is N5YEO, Stephen, San Antonio. Kilo Golf 5, uniform, Kilo uniform, David, thank you, Mr. Keith. There's one station that's trying to get in, and I'm sorry, I can't, can't pick you up. On each check-in, you uh, try and check in, but uh, you drop the repeater immediately. I can't hear you. Uh, it's not that we don't like you. It's that we can't hear you. So let me go ahead and get the final check-in. So I got k 5 tsk that's broke N5YEO, Stevens, San Antonio. Uh, uniform, Kilo Uniform, that's David and Mesquite, and Kilo Golf 5, Papa Mike, that's Rich in Rockwall. And Billy, I, would, uh, I think I mentioned you earlier if it didn't, K5 PDS, Miss Billy, I got you checked in as well. Get to the bottom of the screen. Here we go. Tonight we had 30 kids, not bad. Participating on the net. did check in this evening. We hope you're joining us next week and every Saturday. We can discuss astronomy, space, and space observation because on this net, the sky is new. We're always looking for net control stations. Really, we are. If you can do that or be part of any of the DRC nets, uh, please send an email to net. At W5ST or you can follow topics and discussions about this net and astronomy on Facebook and our audio and video streams. Video are and other useful internet resources by going to whiskey.friedchicken.org at the conclusion of this net. Till next Saturday night, this is Kilo Echo 5 and you're Charlie Trey, Tom, and I'll be closing the net at. Uh, uh, 22.35 local time. And I'm returning the repeater to normal amateur use for about another five minutes. And then we come back and we do the Astro Movie Net. We are talking about a pretty cool, uh, time traveling movie, which is uh, future. So we'll come back to the future in about five minutes, which will be the past everywhere else. Seven three, everybody. Thanks. This was a great night. I appreciate it. Uh, KE five ICX. I'm clear for now. This is N five H one testing. Be five top. Be five B. Watch N five H Y P clear for glow.
and Y Y-E-O. Hey, Steve, I'll say a quick hello. I'm actually I'm up in Norman. How you doing? One minute and eight seconds till Afterglow. I'll give you one more chance, Steve. Go ahead. And YEO. Battery's getting weak. Gotta go. N5 YEO. Sound like you're saying you're getting weak. It does sound like you're out of order, so to speak. I hope you're getting along and getting where it is you need to get taken care of there and get better. And uh, hope John here is going to back off. We've got about 15 seconds left. K5, just clear for netter. While trying to figure out who's net control, please stand by from world control. Yeah, she did do last week, now that I think about it. Okay. It's my turn in the barrel. I was not controlling this horse. I will because I'm dedicated to ICX. I guess I'm not controlling for tonight. Yeah, boy, back to anybody else. Hey, so what is this uh, net about? Well, this one is very informal this evening, and that has to do with talking about something that you all watch or remember or otherwise want to uh, make part of today. It is the year 2020. You're in 
most of our lives uh, moving up to this point. And as such, there are plenty of films that have actually happened since 20, um, because we now live in the future. Such a movie tonight is our choice, which is back to that was actually in 1985, or is actually released in 1985. A wonderful film, which actually takes uh, several into the future and back to the future too, which is no future of 2015. However, there we go back in time to 1955. Back in time, yeah, I know. That's there, and it's pretty cool. So, let me go ahead and give a kind of a description of the plot in case you hadn't figured it out already. I think every person who is alive has seen this movie. If they haven't, you have to see it. So, here's the plot for 1985 Hill Valley, California. Marty McFly off the home and lab of his friend. And it's Dr. Brown, an eccentric local scientist. We all have them. That's actually eccentric local scientist that's uh, surprised. Though meaning for, though missing for several days, the doc called on the lab and asked Marty to pick up some for a special experiment later that night. Marty meets his girlfriend, Jennifer Parker, and after being berated by the principal and a failing for the Battle of the Bands, he can find Jennifer that he fears that he will become like his parents by his friends. At home, Marty's cowardly father is bullied by his supervisor, Biff at Tenon, while his mother, Lorraine, is in a way depressed alcoholic. I think that's everybody. Lorraine recalls how she met George when her father hit him with his car. She subsequently nursed him back to health. Marty needs Doc at the parking lot on the shopping mall, the Twin Pines shopping mall, at 1 a.m. on October 26th. Doc unveils the time machine built from a modified DeLorean and powered by plutonium obtained by Libyan Terror with the promise of building a nuclear bomb. While showing Marty the controls, Doc sets the date to November 5th, 1955. Day, the day uh, he conceived a uh, time machine. Terrorists arrive unexpectedly, open fire on him. Finally, she when he surrenders. Marty escapes in the door and, and inadvertently activates the time machine in the process. Marty finds himself November 5th, 1955. To return, he encounters the teenage George and discovers that Biff has been bullying him since high school. After Marty saves for it from an oncoming car, he is knocked unconscious and awakens to find himself tending who becomes infuriated with him. No, I'm not going to continue to read this because this probably. Lit. Oh yeah, it goes on and on and on. Everybody has seen this movie. Back to the Future, the original movie from 1985. That is our discussion topic this evening. So I'm going to go ahead and take uh, We're going to start with your call sign, your name, where you're transferring. Did you see the movie? It doesn't mean if you saw it recently or a long time ago. It means did you see the movie? And by the way, if you did, we're probably going to ask for your, your comments along the way. I think this is pretty true. Uh, um, popular movie, so I'm going to go ahead and take check-ins. Your your call sign phonetically. Your we're transmitting from. Did you see the movie? Please come now. November five, Bravo, Bravo. Bill and Irving. Yes, I did see the movie. I may or may not make comments because I will probably confuse things in the first movie compared to follow-ups. It's heavy. Number Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony, Portable in Dallas. Aaron and I did watch... 
Kilo Fox Top 5, Papa Delta Sierra, and yes, I have seen the film. I saw it a long time ago. I haven't had time to watch it, but although I wanted to. And Brenda says she thinks Shaq Ben, but I didn't hear anything. Kilo Golf 5, Blue Whiskey, Jay Near Whatever, I did film again. Kilo 
Foxtrot 5, and I got a Foxtrot in there. Can uh, boost your power to the left, please? Try one more time. You're you're in and out of the repeater. I'm sorry. Not my personal preference. I'd prefer that I could hear you nine by nine, but I don't. Uh, the Kilo Fox 5 and question mark, Foxtrot. Question mark. Go ahead. It's okay. Later on, just listen in and then figure out if you can increase power, and we'll get you in on the next round. I've got an asterisk next to your name, and I'll call you out later on. WT9 Victor. Oh, actually, Mike, over in Plano, he didn't see the movie, but I have a suspicion he's seen the movie. So I've got you checked in. Anyone else, please come out.
Apollo is fun. We watched it as a, a date night movie on Friday. It has a hilarious plot hole in it. There's really no chance that you wouldn't remember this strange character that you met in high school who inexplicably happens to sound and look exactly like your son. I mean, that just wouldn't happen. They'd wonder why their son was turning into this character from their past. But we don't care because the story is well paid. It keeps moving and it's exciting and it was genuinely good. It's entertaining. So we forgive it its little foibles because it had a cute shaggy dog in it. And plutonium. An odd moment of reason was the plutonium in the weird plastic cartridges full of clear liquid. It does turn out that an plutonium is often handled in containers full of clear minerals because it has this nasty tendency to spontaneously ignite in the presence of ordinary air. So that's cute. Uh, but what was much better was the wonderful plot device of the picture Marty McFly, Michael J. Fox, had with him showing his gradually family members. There's really no reason it would happen that way. I mean, well, I don't often talk sports cars, but I don't think there's a reason it would happen that way. But it was an absolutely fantastic tool uh, for keeping the plot moving, for keeping score, for letting us know how well the was doing without having to go into a lot of math or combinations or things that we just couldn't follow, like in, say, Primer or Primer or whatever that was. had good music and fun dancing and um, just lots of amusing conceits. You know, progress is my middle name, and mayor's campaigns haven't changed very much over the years. We had that great device with the picture. Uh, we had the most obvious plot holes. We had a good shaggy dog worked in there. Uh, just to complain about with the plot, except it was too much fun. And All right, thank you, Tony. I, this is certainly better than last week's movie. I thought the Bollywood film was fantastically... At any rate, let's go on to N5HYP. Uh, that would be Tom and company in Irving. Your thoughts on Back to the Future. And I know you're thinking of that back in time. Go ahead, Tom. N5HYP, 5 ICX. Yes, we did watch it last night. I actually went to the theater and saw it back in um, 1985. We were living in an Austin at the time. Great movie, boy, did the 80s um, watching this. It, it's a fun ride. Um, you know, um, Michael, the time, you know, before that movie, uh, has uh, involvement with the uh, family ties. Uh, 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 a sitcom, and uh, the movie, he was, you know, very good at, uh, at humor and, and uh, face and such to relate the humor, and so um, uh, that is to put him um, uh, as the, the lead character in this movie. Um, it was, you know, Again, it was it was a fun Spielberg, of course, being a great director as he is. It um, uh, it, uh, it it had great pacing. It worked well. Um, you know, I you, 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 um, the the twin when you know Marty's mom is hot uh, doesn't know that uh, that he's her child until he, she kisses him. And uh, then um, realize it just doesn't feel right. Um, you know, just the way. It, there's a lot of fun things involved with this movie. It's a great ride. And I was glad to see it again. Glad to see it pop up on the list. Uh, more later. Send 5 HYP. Very good. 
what, 35 years now? Hard to believe that this thing's been on. In fact, I just finished it up uh, while we were checking in here because I wanted to watch it fresh. And, you know, there are a couple couple things about the plot I, I find fascinating. What, first of all, is you got to fight the bully. Uh, my dad told me that when I was a kid, and I learned that. And, and you always have to fight the bully. If you take the bully, he's going to keep coming at you or she. And, and you got to fight the bully. You might take a licking, but you know what? It always turns out better. Anyway, break. Uh, the other thing is you're attracted to people that look like you. <laughs> it just is the way it is. It's not surprising that his mother at time was and found him hot. But, you know, they figured that wasn't right at the end of the day. So that was interesting, right? As a side note, the DeLorean was not a great movie made that car. Um, they they had that car every year. I don't know if you guys know about the Dallas uh, the festival. So, uh, it's coming up here in, in March. Uh, I plan on well, They usually show that, uh, I think, a car that's decked out like that. It wasn't a great car. It was a dog. I'm surprised made it to 80 miles an hour. But anyway, um, I think he was believable, but you know when the when the doc held that, uh, he should have been fried by that lightning. But you know, I guess his hair always lightning, so and maybe it's okay. Because I wish I could go back to 1955. It looks pretty good. But anyway, um, uh, I love this movie, and I don't know why. It did cost me about four bucks on Amazon. It was AG 5 p.m. I thank you, Rich. And I'm sorry, the hot uh, I couldn't find it anywhere else. So I, I, I put it there. Not twenty dollars out, out of every uh, you know. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. I hope I don't get in trouble. Uh, KF5TSK, Borough in Dallas. Borough, you're on the plot. KE5ICX. This is kf Well, this is one of those but it's uh, maybe the plot wasn't really that great, but, you know, the acting was good. It was a comedy. It kept you entertained. There was not really uh, things that there were no action. You know, action throughout. It was enjoyable to watch. So maybe they made technical errors, but it it was entertaining. So, uh, you know, I, I, the plot, you know, it was KF5TSK back to net. Uh, next up, KF5PDS, uh, Miss Billy over in Sherman. Welcome back. There's a thing with Cotter. But I need my time machine to do that. Mine's not a DeLorean. Mine's a Pinto. Uh, Ms. PBS, uh, your thoughts on the plot? Great. Well, thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's great to be back. Um, yeah, I love this movie. I saw it originally in 1985, and I'm the same age as Marty McFly. So uh, any movie that was made, like high school movie back in the late 80s, like or mid mid 80s, uh, I was the same age as those characters. Those, um, and I just absolutely adored the film. It's so much fun, and it's you know it's a great piece of iconography now. You know, I'll have a you know highly quotable uh, quotes from the movies of, from all three, you know. Uh, and uh, a, any movie that opens with a Rube Goldberg machine is aces in my book. <laughs> uh, it's always a great way to start off the movie. I just love, you know, it's the way to feed the dog. You know, he's got this great elaborate thing Doc Brown has. 
and is, introduces you right away to the eccentricity of the character before you even meet the character. So it always has curiosity and is a lot of fun. Um, and I, I agree with everything that Tony said earlier. Uh, and if you want a primer-like discussion, uh, Tony, we need to talk about two really where it gets uh, interesting. But, yeah, I love the, the, the time travel. And as Tony pointed out, the picture is a perfect little barometer of what's going on and, and uh, how close are we to being really back and everything restored. You know, it's such a great visual way to do that. I totally agree with what Tony said about the, about the picture. Um, and, yeah, it's a fun, yeah, going back in time to right or wrong and – uh, and the mayhem do, uh, you know, when uh, Marty is the one that gets picked up off the street instead of George, and then Marty's got to work to get it back on track. You know, I think that was just so great, you know, being able to pal around with his with his young dad. It's hard. You can't really talk about the, the plot without involving invo characterization in this one. The plot is the characterization. The, plot, the movie moves well. It's got a lot of action. Uh, it's very engaging. You know, you don't think how much time is passing, you know, while you're watching it. Time is fun. So um, I think, like uh, Tom's uh, HYP said, it's a great flick. Um, and uh, go back to the 80s. I would love to go. So, so much fun. Uh, so anyway, uh, I love the love the. Uh, never thought it had any kind of lag or drag or anything. It's just from start to finish, uh, as others said, a great ride and a lot of fun. Still a lot of fun to watch. It's a movie I don't think I will ever tire of watching. Uh, so with that, I'll return it to you. Five PDF back to Matt. from 1985. Moving on. Ozell, oh, Miss Brenda, your comments on plot. This is WB5 Ozell. Oh, well, I just think this movie is one of the most perfect movies ever. There is absolutely I could find fault with. And um, the plot was just so wonderful and so clever and so entertaining. Best time travel movies hurt my head. You just you just get the heebie jeebies because of this function and this story and uh it just it's irritating but this one doesn't do that. It, everything actually seems uh, and it was just a good story. You care about the character what's gonna happen and there is so much, you know, I love the beginning with all the clocks. You know, it's a time travel story, and you have the clock theme. Uh, not just there, but in other places, too. So uh, you're just looking for all these little clever things that, uh, that the, uh, the director puts in. And uh, we went to the Universal Studios and saw the set where this was filmed. It's a thrill for my kids. It looks just like that. All right, back to that. WB5 OZO. Next up is KG5B, that is Jay near Weatherford, where they have the best cheese sandwiches. Jay, Jay, not Jay, Jay Revere, no, Jay near Weatherford, uh, please go ahead with your analysis of the plot. Please go ahead. This is the KG5BW. 
Um, yeah, the blue eye. There's really not much that you. Hold, hold on. I'm here for myself. Um, there's not much you can, uh, that I can complain about on the plot. It's, uh, it's just, I don't want to call it perfect. There's a place where, I don't know, it's, um, <laughs> there's, just, there's, there's some cringe points, but, um, uh, I don't know. It, it, I, it works for comedy. Um, oh gosh, there, there, there's so many things I want to say about that, that aren't really like plot related. Um, they they actually it, it's kind of funny. I, I was like so many years old. I can't remember which part of the year this uh, movie came out. Uh, and you know this this movie is uh, for to a seven year old. This made this movie made the DeLorean look awesome. Now as an adult, I look at this film and I can see how much it also look, makes it look like a dog too. Uh, it, it's 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 just the the fact that it, it takes forever to accelerate to eighty miles per hour, eighty seven miles per hour. Um, the starter not working and all of that. It, 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 it's something that it's it just. I, I miss it when I'm a kid because I don't have any reference of what the good car is. But as an adult, I was like, oh, wow, this is. Yeah, this is um <laughs> interesting car. Anyway, um, so, uh, I mean, it, it, it's. The, the the science and and stuff doesn't make sense. Actually, let me reset. Hold on. Okay. Uh, and the science of everything doesn't make sense. The metaphor really doesn't make sense, except for it really makes sense for story, the story, like like. Tony said, it's just it's a, the metaphor. I'm talking about the picture. I'm, that is the metaphor of how of uh, goals achieved or whatnot. Uh, it's just it's a wonderful visual metaphor. But uh, you know, it's like how does not meeting something uh, goal or something mean somebody's head? doesn't exist anymore. It, it, no, but it, it doesn't really matter because you, you see, oh, where the head's got, well, okay, we need to do something to restore our okay, okay, okay. So it, it's almost like its own little mini game kind of thing. Anyway, I, I, there's, there's really, I, and seeing how many, <clears throat> seeing all these films that we've seen and this, that makes you really, Makes you realize just how good a film this thing is, and it's. it's I I always kind of thought it was kind of average, not average, a little better than average. I I did think it was better than average growing up, but I I also saw it so many times too that it's like yeah, it's you you, it, but it when you get compared, oh my gosh, so many films just did not have what this film has. And I'll end on that. KG5 BZW. QJ. Next up is Whiskey Tango 9, Victor Mike in Plano. He says he didn't see the movie. I don't know if that means ever.
seen it multiple times, and I've always enjoyed why I've seen it multiple times in the past. Um, I good things that I just get into and watch, and, and you know, I've never tried to pick it apart or tried to plot because it all flows. Nice. You know, the, the bits go together. It seems and it's a lot of fun, you know, and I don't know, I've, I've never put it the woods that, you know, try deeper meanings and things like, you know, the, the lesson of the bullies or anything like that. And I always wanted, I always wanted a time traveling DeLorean. I'm, I'm very suspicious about your time traveling Penta because that scene top secret comes to mind. Um, if it doesn't know it, Google top secret pinto scene. Uh, I don't know, I just, I've, I've always liked the movie a lot, and uh, I'm probably gonna watch it as soon as I get a little bit of time. I was hoping to do it today, but just didn't have time. Seventeen ninety. Need to go back in time. And you hear that song, don't you, Huey Lewis, and yesterday's news. I think that was a group. Okay, I'll take additional check-ins. Let's see, I got uh, KF5, uh, something, Fort Worth. Uh, if you're out there, maybe you improved your position. Let me try one more time for you because you did check in. That station that had any letters that even matched up remotely. Try now. It's Kilo Go 5, Papa Mike, November, James, in Fort Worth. I uh, was mobile up on. Around the Tarrant County line on 287 when I tried to check it. Um, I didn't get to see the movie this time around. I saw it years ago, and I don't re- remember it well enough to make comments, so I'll just listen. Catch you 5 p.m. in. Back to the net. Hey, I'm sure the guy. All right, thanks for coming in on Echo Link. Sorry, we couldn't pick you up uh, that well uh, otherwise. It was very spotty and with lots of noise. But uh, thanks for checking in and appreciate your support. And I'll, I'll uh, put you as uh, just uh, listening on this one. But uh, thank you again for checking in. My best movie, first thought, it was so much fun. This darn thing just moves and moves and just keeps going from one scene to the next to the next. And it does so in a a urgent but not overwhelming way. Not tons of special effects to to, to take over and make the movie uh, be something else. I think today, if they were to reboot this movie, the the special effects would take over and it wouldn't be what it it was, which was a lot of darn fun. It was great. I loved it. I loved it. Every character was interesting and colorful and had a, a, a piece to play. There was no um, uh, insertion of uh, dumb stuff along in order to uh, fill out a movie. This thing is jam-packed with stuff going on throughout the thing. And, the, you know, the time travel part is always interesting because how do you handle time travel? Nobody's ever done that before that we're aware of. And as such, how do you handle uh, change in time? Does it, does it, does it um, happen in real real time? I oh, got you got to do this space-time thing and mention the word time. So this one was interesting. I wasn't of the uh, disappearing part as a as a plot point, but of course, big difference. Oh my God! Was it underneath the sea um, thing, and and everybody gets back together and it's So I was with that. I thought 
but that was uh, really good that they, they then of course it ends it ends and we have an alternate line and then uh, Dr. Brown comes back and says uh, we got to take care of your kids problem which means that everything going forward is now screwed as well and we don't know exactly where Dr. Brown is in all of this and 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 how that matches out. Now, something. This idea has been posited for forward, uh, particularly with Star Trek, with these multiple reboots, and we have multiple timelines that we have to deal with, which is really annoying in a way because even you now I'll go ahead and pitch for uh, Picard. We don't know what timeline we're actually living in. And uh, after, you know, 25 years, years of Star Trek, the next gen, and how that's changed, uh, I think we're going to see more of that going forward. Uh, just, uh, 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 and I only digress on that point because in Back to the Future, we have an altered timeline going forward, which means nerd, nerd detour ahead. So that's Okay, anyone else want to check in before I go to the top of the list? Right, it's highly unusual, but um, in this case, we talk about plot and we get tons and tons of comments. But uh, the thing is characterization, which generally gets up blah, because uh, the movie's overwhelming thing is the special effects and storyline, or underwhelming thing is special effects and storyline. Let's go ahead and talk about characterization. So, Bill, N5BB, what do you think about the characters in this thing? Please go ahead from KE5ICX. In fact, maybe. Oh, Tom, the characters were just great. So Michael J. Fox was the confused kid just trying to make it through the movie. He's just trying to get through. He's just trying to undo the things that happened and just to get through hide from people and anyway. So I think he did a great job and he played a kid. Uh, and uh, Dr. Brown played the nutty crazy professor. And I couldn't have been played by a better actor. <laughs> With the loose coat and the crazy look on his face and Everything. So that Biff was the dumb, stupid bullet, and uh, the character, and they could reuse it multiple. You notice the way they did this is that this character is they change things. Maybe things change about Biff. It's a really good characterization that they can kind of make. And then, of course, his parents that were his parents, which he didn't really understand them very well moving forward, and he had to kind of rethink, oh, man, his parents had feelings, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as his girlfriend. So... It uh, had great characterization. In fact, BB. Thank you, Bill. I agree. Now, Tony, your thoughts on characterization? Well, thank you, Tom. I've got to agree with Bill. Uh, you know, when a movie's got good characters, yeah, 
we could almost just have them all read from the phone book or something, and we'd find the movie. Uh, would have a better plot than than that. reading here, maybe once. Uh, but the characters sure made it even better. Uh, especially loved. Uh, oh boy, for the physical humor uh, between you know Michael J. Fox and uh, the character who played his father, Kristen Glover or Crispin Glover. Uh, you know, imitating each other's gestures and postures, uh, just really good, you know, like father, like son. Uh, that's just really good acting, not the words, but, you know, the way you stand, where you put your elbow, and uh, it takes a lot of work, and, when and it just makes us laugh, and we don't even know why until we think about it later. John was a classic, classic, stereotypical mad scientist. Uh, I could relate to him because I have that same sort of problem with taking people way too literally. Heavy? What do you mean heavy? Is there some kind of problem with the Earth's gravitational field? Uh, but, you know, his own quirks and his own ability to say, what the heck? All of his speeches about, we cannot change the future, we cannot change the future, he taped that together. Aaron was really struck by that. You know, oh, I think that. Uh, that that was just really something. Even if he didn't get electrocuted by the lightning and his hair was standing up already, uh, he was a heck of a character. I I had a great time with Doc. Yes, Aaron very much agrees with N5B there about, of course, parents all put themselves as I would never have done that in your age. And there was his mother drinking and doing nefarious things in a parked car with boys. Uh, all of which, of course, she would deny later that she did. I do have to stick up for a small but fun character trip. Doc Brown loved that Dymo labeling tape. He labeled everything with flux capacitor, do not break glass. Uh, there was a very label he remembered to put on the giant guitar amplifier with its Klystron tubes uh, that, uh, that Marty McFly was using at the beginning of the movie. That was, of course, a CRM114 amplifier, if you read the labels carefully, uh, which had previously played an important role in Dr. Strangelove. So, uh, from the little details of the amplifier to the other, uh, character made me happy. NT5TM. Look for background Easter eggs, and you found one that I wasn't aware of. And darn you, darn you all to hell, you darn dirty something. Any rate, okay, I got it. That is by HYP and Company at Hell. What did you think about the plot? Please, uh, not a characterization. You can talk about the plot if you want, but go ahead. Characterization, N5HO from KE5A.
blah. The actor, uh, I love them all. You know, that's what can you say about Christopher Lloyd? Uh, Chris, I is 47 years before he made the. He's 82. He might have been 80. In fact, I thought I didn't even know he was stolen until I looked him up. But yeah, he's still. character was brain dog. You know, talk about her a little bit. That's that was Michael like mother, played by Lee Tom. Interesting thing, Lee Tom and Michael J. Fox were both born in nineteen sixty one. So, uh she was playing his mother even though they were born the same year. Uh now there's another actor, uh actress uh, Wendy Joe Sperber, who was played Michael J. Fox's, I guess, younger sister, but she was actually three years older than Michael J. Fox was, and uh, and, the, and the actor that played his mother, the daughter was three years older than his mother, but I mean, pulled it off, you know. Okay, uh, Crispin Glover. George McFly, the, the nerdy guy that got beat up by everybody. You know, I didn't know this. And uh, there's another amazing thing I just found out. It was that Crispin Glover's father was uh, Bruce Glover. Now, who's Bruce Glover? Well, if you ever remember Diamonds Are Forever, which was my favorite James Bond movie, I can't watch that enough times. I mean, every other movie, you know, after you watch it so many times, you know, you know all about it. But I can so I can watch Diamonds Are Forever tomorrow and just enjoy it like I like the first time. Well, anyway, remember Mr. Wint and Mr. Kid Glover, who was Crispin Glover's father, was Mr. Wint. How weird. Okay, moving on. I won't go down the whole list, but uh, the, the, the school teacher, the Mr. Uh, Strickland, and actually I had a school teacher her name was Mrs. Strickland when I was about in the seventh grade. I think she was my homeroom teacher or something. But anyway, uh, this Mr. Strickland was played by uh, James Tolkien, and he's kind of a nobody recognizes him, but he pops up in a lot of different movies because he has that bald head and he always plays the same kind of role. But if you ever watched uh, Nero Wolf, uh, the, 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 one, the TV series, and this is all this is on uh, you can get on YouTube, on YouTube if you want. The great stuff. This is on with Timothy Hutton and uh, Maury Chagan. But Timothy Hutton always plays Archie. Maury Chagan always plays Nero Wolf. The rest of the, the rest of the cast play different roles, and, and one of Another actor who's in every movie is uh, James Tolkien, and in one one movie, you know, one episode he might be an FBI agent, another episode he might be a criminal or something like that. But they they got about a dozen, about a half a dozen or so actors that are in every other movie, in every movie, but they just play different roles. I guess that's about it, but yeah, I mean, I, I love this. It's a great movie, great movie. Every movie in the world should be made like this. So uh, with that, I will, oh, uh, Huey Lewis, that was, yeah, Huey Lewis. They were, they were a rock band back in the 80s. Uh, oh, and the disappearing part that Tom mentioned, he didn't like. I thought that was quite interesting that they, they weave that in there because it's a basic time paradox, you know, it's kind of like creation of what if you go back in time and you kill your grandparents and you're born, and, you, and you'll never be born, but you're never born, how could you go back and kill your grandparents? It's that, like, the wood in there like that. I thought it was, you know, very, so I like that part too. So back
Thanks, Nick. M5HYP, I'm back. All right, Tom, you, you're going to have to stand aside for a second. Stand aside. Stand aside. You ran off when we needed you. I looked down the list uh, here. There could be plenty of people who could who could uh, follow you. Okay. N5HYP, Tom, your comments on characterization. You had extra time to think about it, so make it good. N5HYP from KE5ICX. This is HYP, I'll be real brief. Um, I think Christopher was a great choice of character of, of Doc Brown. Um, he can play a really crazy guy. Uh, he did that on t uh, and um, um, so it was fun to see that kind of role and over in amped up in overdrive. Um, I did want to mention there's a plot thing. It's also an effect thing, but it also leads into the characters. Uh, I loved, you know, the the device the super used in bringing in having McFly come, uh, uh, Marty come back uh, to the present time one minute before he left. The fact that he we see himself. And they used very different camera angles um, to show him looking at him as um, what happened earlier on in the movie. That was a great, a great device, a great um, uh, view. And that was one of my favorite movies, actually. But anyway, back to that. Zen 5 h Okie Tom, and you make a good point uh, that up. Uh, I'm just going to put little notes here because you brought up something really important about time uh, travel on TV when you're looping it. And there is looping, as they say. Or loopy looping. All right, got that. Let's see. Next up, and thanks for your comments, 85 p.m. Rich. Your comments on characterization, please go ahead, from KE5ICX. Thanks for waking me up. Uh, I was dozing off there. Uh, um, boy, I'm impressed with the deep thoughts that uh, everybody's had on these characters. They've been great. Um, I don't know that I have the analytical skills left, given my, my synapses want to shut down here and go to bed. I'm about two hours and 47 minutes past my normal bedtime. But that said, the one thing I, that I thought was interesting was the good-natured way that uh, George McFly took his ass kickings. Uh, can I say that? I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Um, but took his uh, butt kickings, and um, and I think if, if fast-forwarded to 2020, he'd probably go psycho and, and, and do some, you know, bad things uh, at, 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 to get even. But back in 1985, apparently, you know what? You took your bullying and, and, and well, anyway, AG 5 p.m. All right. Thank you, Rich. Uh, yeah, well, well, we'll come back to you in a little bit. Don't forget, you got to talk about uh, special effects here in a few minutes. Next up is uh, KFI TSK. Burl, your comments on characterization. I know you got comments because you have comments. You're very good on characterization, so let us down. KFI TSK from KE5 ICX. Uh, this is KFI TSK. I thought that, uh, you know, everyone in the movie really played their part. Um, you know, when you look at it, uh, you know, 35 years later, it, it's uh, it's funny. The the whole thing seems to, to fit. It's still a comedy. 
it's still enjoyable to watch, and uh, I think the characters really, you know, brought those things out that you weren't really, you know, focused on the technical aspect of the thing, but, uh, you know, there were a lot of mistakes made. It, you know, they made it exciting, you know, that we're going to do this. We're going to go back to the future. Hey, Burl. Well, I was expecting more from you, but I expect more from you coming up later. I always give you a hard time because you're the guy that has the answers to all these movies, particularly Primer, Primer, whatever the name of that movie was. You have the answer. Uh, next up, PBS, Miss Billy over in Sherman. Your thoughts on characterization. Now, I know you've got tons to say about this. You know these characters. You know this movie. And you're a kindred spirit. Can't uh, fight PBS from KE5 ICX. Go ahead. Great, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I I agree with uh, what other folks said. Yeah, Chris Floyd was perfectly cast, and uh, after playing the one Jim and Taxi, he was the obvious great, brilliant choice to play Doc Brown. Um, and uh, what's interesting that I've read up on, and I've also seen like making of the of the film and had in the past, and Michael J. Fox was not the first choice. They filmed for several weeks. Stoltz. Uh, who had played in some other uh, 80s, uh, like Mask and uh, Some Kind of Wonderful, which is a, a good 1980s flick. Um, and uh, on this documentary, they showed some of the footage uh, with Doc, him and Doc Brown uh, in the Twin Pines Mall parking lot when Doc Brown was in a DeLorean time machine. And it's interesting to watch their footage together, some of the rushes, because the chemistry is just not there. After they filmed for several weeks, they realized this. Eric Stoltz was replaced with Michael J. Fox, whose chemistry clicked so dramatically, you know, in the rest of history. Um, so I thought that was very interesting that Michael J. Fox was not the first choice, but I'm so glad they chose him. And I think they originally that he had too many conflicts with family ties because I think he was simultaneously filming Family Ties episodes and filming the movie, so he was extremely busy. But love, he has a quirkiness of his own, and it's like he and Doc are just like in their own world, and and they just, together they make sense. themselves they don't make sense, but together they, as a duo they make sense. And uh, to, you know, do this time-traveling escapade to try to, and fix things, you know, and uh, you know, Michael J. Fox ends up back in time in accident. At first, he, you know, tries it out, and then he ends up messing things up, and he's asked to help him fix things and send him back. Um, so I think it was so wonderful, you know, able to go back and find Doc and reacquaint himself, you know, with and uh, and then they were able to work to solve this problem, um, and I think it's great that he accidentally he is the one who causes the uh, the lightning strike lightning strike tower, and they were all they used that. Track. I thought that was just brilliantly done, um, and of course, yeah, all the you know some quirkiness, and it all works. You know, just everybody's quirks come together to make this great film, cleverly done. Um, I love that they got – he was a hoot playing the dad and Leah Thompson. I thought it was funny, like, uh, Tanner came down so well. And uh, Michael J. Fox, when Marty saw his mom, like, drinking, and he was like, you smoke too? And she was like, you're starting to – it's like how we start to echo what we heard 
you know, a young kid, we start to echo those things that we heard from our parents, uh, and you feel things come full circle. So there were many times when you saw this full circle full in many different ways over and over again, and it just made it satisfying and fun. Um, the one character that I got a kick out of that, you know, never had parents except as a baby was little baby Joey. Later in the that he is in jail and having getting out and not making parole and we find out as a kid is because you know he's that large contributing factor was he was in his playpen he would cry every time they took him out so they just left him in and it's like ah now you understand what's happening to Joe in the in the future and you never see him as an adult but that's alluded to uh, and it's just interesting to see you know how characters end up um that they were able to tweak the tweak the past just enough to create a much more favorable future, but as Tony pointed out, things go by right or ahead in the future, and then that requires fixing. It's like once you start tweaking the past, you accidentally start tweaking other things, you know, and it uh, just ripples ripples in time. I think it did the time travel exploration in a very fun way, um, especially. Nature too, it gets more convoluted, but they still keep it, you know, fresh and exciting and fun without bogged down in technicality, um, and it just stays really fresh and fun um, and action packed. So um, I really enjoy. Them. They're a lot of fun to listen to and watch and think about too, and. Uh, you know, there's moments I think we can all pick out at different times and different characters to relate to those things. Um, and I love that uh, Marty uses his dad's love of science fiction to persuade him to help him by saying he's Darth Vader from the planet Vulcan. He's going to melt his brain if he doesn't help him with that. And I thought that was just one of the most brilliant scenes in the film. So hilarious. Um, there's so many moments I'm sure everybody can pick out their own gems. So. Uh, stop here, but uh, those are some of my favorite little gem moments of the film. But all the characters just are also quirky and they're and lovable in their own way, and, and together they just make a wonderful ensemble. So uh, with that, I'll return it to you. This is KFI's PDS back to now. the heck out of that uh, as far as characterization because uh, yeah it, it, it all clicks but I'll, I'll save my comments uh, in a little bit WB5 OZL oh, Miss Brenda your comments on characterization please go ahead from KE5 ICX WB5 OZL oh, well you just get the sense that uh, the characters are just absolutely perfectly cast. And you can't imagine anybody else in those roles. Uh, they all just did such a super job of capturing that personality. Uh, it just, I just think it's brilliant. And also what's interesting, characters had a lot of kind of growth. So you saw them and yeah, you kind of cheer for that. Um, you know, their, their personality just uh, you know, maybe quirky. Uh, they were just fun. Even the yucky ones like Biff. It, it's just fun to watch these people because they're stupid. All right. I'm going to turn it back. This is WB5 OZ. No, I, I got you on the last round. I, so, uh, Jay, what do you 
wanted Doc Brown for a friend. I don't. I wanted Doc Brown for a friend. I don't know about the rest of you. Everything I need. Time is twelve oh five a.m. All right, thank you, Michael. And oh, to let everybody know, we're back on normal time again. Apparently, this is going to go a little longer. One key and key in case we back to time out after. I think it's three minutes or something. That in mind. Um, okay. Uh, any additions, please come now before I make my my personal comment. Additional check-ins, please come now. We're talking about, talking about, oh, uh, back to the future. Please come now. W5FC. All right, my comments on this movie, I love it. There's no two ways about it. The character fleshed out, or maybe in a cartoonish way, but out in a way that was really fun. The movie uh, pace was fantastic. It made sense. Uh, it had a, a, a about it from a, 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 a plot standpoint. Me character a coffee through the whole and that everything's got to happen. Even though they have Time to figure everything out because it's convoluted together in a precise way. That's what's really cool. Uh, I think you know, Billy mentioned uh, mentioned earlier that you know the time is always a part of it under the clock. Even though you have enough at last to do any and everything you want to do. You don't have any anything. You have to get through it. it happens, and you got to go, and you got to return the timeline back to normal. I get to home, which is you know, I the the whole thing is the you know, love, love, love the characters. I've tried to pattern myself after here. Um, my house and house and you is different from everybody else because we're the Emmett Brown cat. Everybody knows that. It's kind of nice and nerdy to know. Just my opinion. And this is Kate. You see we are talking to the future. We'll continue on. I am going to the top of the list. Basically, anything you want about uh, about the comes. But if you think you got that in any form, you are allowed to do so because you don't do anything. What do you got to add? Uh, the sky's the limit. From I see it. Gloria, that it has to get to a certain speed in the future. That's all a special thing. Good night, BB. Oh, I couldn't have said it any better. All right, I'm checking off. If I your comments, anything you want. I can write, you can't hold a big sphere of plutonium in your hand. Uh, shavings. Apparently, I was reading about the shavings. when Those have to be stored carefully because they can spontaneously. But no, the mild and supportive of the movie. All great choice. Had a great night.
opening. Um, anyway, um, I'll Effects really were not not really necessary to make the movie. I mean, I to go with uh, and probably we saw more effects at the end of the last 30 seconds of the movie, and that's fine. I think the movie, the, the whole story, and, and I love this movie much better than that movie, which I, I, I'm sorry, I love you more. Even I saw movies. You just can't. You just can't read it. Not for me, because I saw the originals, and and they weren't. But I, dig, I digress because again, I'm I'm check it out. Ag five p.m. Have a great night. Oh my! Okay, I think for the terrible movie is. Yeah. That night, but it's okay. <laughs> Let's see. K five K, bro, you're got anything you want about this movie. Go ahead. E five I C X. One thing that I would say that uh, you know the special effects really weren't great. They were good. I mean, for you know the time. Uh, a lot of times we, we, there were special effects and it keeps you wanting something, but, you know, they were adequate for the time, you know, like with today, that uh, uh, there was nothing that uh, looked like it was missed. One of the major things about the movie is, you know, this was just a budget movie or a B movie. You know, there was time and uh, to a good movie. Can't find TSK back to net. All right, thank you, Burl, and thanks for your comments. Next by PDS, Miss Billy. Insurance, anything you want, special effects or otherwise, please come now. Yeah, um, I like this is a good example. There's not a lot of special effects, um, but they're very integral to the story. So, you know, there's not a lot of overtly unnecessary special effects. And, of course, with the characters, they had to do it purely with makeup, uh, you know, because CGI, you know, not really used on people. You know, they had, you know, DeLorean effects and everything. And, of course, I love the music, you know, Huey Lewis and the News, awesome band and great music. And, uh, you know, their song Back in Time, my the beginning of the movie, and they were under the talent uh, they were playing Huey Lewis and the new uh, song Back in Time, and the I thought it was hilarious that the, the talent show shut him down and said, you're just loud, was Huey Lewis. I thought that was awesome. They gave him a cameo. Uh, that was just, you know, very well done. Um, just something I want to say, uh, not related to the movie, but it's DeLorean-related. Um, if you've never been to the North Texas Irish Festival, uh, it's a lot of fun. You should go. To go when I went, uh, right as you came in, the front had uh, DeLorean uh, enthusiasts. I don't know if it was a DeLorean club, but great uh, DeLorean cars there that were open inside, and of course there were ones that had the flux capacitor, and I think there was one with fusion on the back. So uh, it was a lot of fun. DeLorean up close, and I don't know if they do that every year, but uh, it's a fun time to go to the eye 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 to the eye, and if you get to see the DeLorean, 